Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the upcoming Windows 11 23H2 update. You're really gonna to wanna to stay tuned for this one because there's a lot of really cool features coming to Windows 11. So, stay tuned. When I make a positive video about Windows 11, I get tons of people in the comments saying that I'm working for Microsoft or that I'm just a Windows shill. I guess that it doesn't really matter how many times I've made videos with the primary purpose of trashing Windows 11. However, if that's what you're looking for today, this isn't going to be the video for you. This video is going to be mostly positive because I can honestly say for some new features coming to 23H2 actually have me considering upgrading to Windows 11. I know, shocker, right? But you know what? Before we get into that, we got to pay some bills. So check out today's sponsor. Is your copy of Windows 10 unactivated? Well, it doesn't have to be because with today's sponsor, VIP SCD key, you can get a valid Windows 10 license for under $20. Stop dealing with that stupid watermark on the desktop, the valid license for Windows 10. Also, with an activated copy of Windows 10, you can upgrade to Windows 11 for free. Just go to the link in the description below and pick up a valid Windows 10 license key. During checkout, use the code CYBERCPU for a 25% discount. Once you have your key, go to your activation settings in Windows 10 and click on the link that says Change Product Key. Enter the product key you just purchased and hit Activate. Now you don't have to deal with that stupid watermark that come with running an unactivated copy of Windows 10. Now, on with the video. I'm gonna put this out there right now before we go any further. There's a really good chance that I'm gonna say 22H2 instead of 23H2 several times in this video. So just be prepared for this. This video is entirely about 23H2 and I'm human and I make mistakes. I mean, I'm still writing 2022 on checks. Anyway, the new upgrade to Windows 11, codenamed Sun Valley 3, should be released in early October according to most of the information that I read putting this video together. And it's also going to be a fairly small update too, because believe it or not, most of the features have already been installed in previous updates. They're just currently disabled while they're in the beta stage, and believe me, there are lots of bugs that still need to be worked out. However, this video isn't about criticizing Microsoft for bugs in a beta build of Windows, because of course there's bugs. It's still in beta. Hopefully they'll get those bugs worked out before it's released, but I don't know, they might. <laughs> but rather than sit here and talk about it though, let's jump on the computer and I'll show you what's coming to Windows 11 in 23H2. Okay, so here we are in Windows 11 23H2. Now this right now is just a beta build, and it should be the most current beta build, at least at the time of filming this video right here. But what we're going to do is there's a lot of features that I want to cover today, so we're just going to jump right in it. And the first one we're going to look at is the Windows Copilot. And to open it, all you got to do is click this new little icon right here for the Copilot. And essentially, all this is, is this is kind of just like a glorified version of ChatGPT. So essentially all you do is just ask it questions and it answers it from Microsoft's new AI. And I think this is what's going to be coming to a lot of versions of Windows lately. However, the program itself works pretty good because as you can tell, a lot of the icons and things of that nature just kind of move out of the way once you open it. So for instance, if we were to close it real quick, and I was to just open an application. So let's say we open File Explorer. We have that sitting on the edge of the screen right here. So as soon as we open this, what it'll do is it'll move everything out of the way so it's not blocking anything that's on your screen. So that's actually works really well. But in reality, all this thing is, at this point at least, is just a toy. Essentially all it is is just ask questions. So if we come down here and we'll say, is Windows 11 smart? Let's see what it has to say about it. And essentially what it does is it's going to go through and it's going to give you an AI response to that. So Windows 11 is the latest version of the Windows operating system released by Microsoft in October 2021. It, is introduce, it introduces a number of new features and improvements over its predecessor, Windows 10. So however, whether or not it's smart is subjective and depends on how you define smart. So maybe it's smart, maybe it's not. I don't know. It doesn't know either, apparently. So some of the things that I noticed is you can change some settings. Like for instance, if I was to say, change to light mode, the assistance itself will give you this. It says, do you want to switch to light mode? And if you hit yes, it'll change everything to light mode. And then if you ask it, 
change to dark mode, it'll go through the same process. It'll ask you if you want to change this to dark mode. And if you hit yes, there you go. You change into dark mode. However, there are certain things that it doesn't have the capability of doing. Like, for instance, I'm running a 144 hertz monitor. So if I was to say, change my refresh rate to 144 hertz, then essentially what it's going to do is it goes through the process and it doesn't give you the option to do that. But from my testing, it does give you instructions on how to do it. So as you come up here, it'll tell you that it'll help you display it. So it'll tell you what steps you need to go through in order to change the refresh rate on the monitor. However, it won't just give it to you. But you know, it does give you a cool little video right there. So maybe that's helpful as well. So here's the thing. I don't know that I'm going to have the Copilot turned on on my version of Windows. However, from what I understand is it's supposed to be replacing Cortana. So it's kind of a win getting rid of Cortana, but I'm still kind of a little creeped out with AI. So I'm, I'm undecided on whether or not I support this move to AI or I don't. I could thinking about Terminator and Matrix and things of that nature. So as long as it doesn't kill humanity, I guess AI is a pretty good thing, but Let's move on to the next feature. Okay, so let's go ahead and close the Copilot right here. And then the next thing I wanna look at is File Explorer. So right off the bat, you can tell that File Explorer has had a pretty big renovation in 23H2. And you know, I took the liberty of actually having a virtual machine loaded right here of a stock version of 22H2, just so we can use it in for comparison. So if we flip over and we were to set these side by side, you can kind of see the difference right here. Let me move this over to the side so we can fit both these on the screen. But as you can see, there is definitely a change in look. So they move the address bar up top and then they move the toolbar down below like that. And then on top of that, and I think this is probably one of the coolest features, is they added this gallery icon. So if you click on this, it essentially goes through all of your pictures and displays them all in a gallery. And I think this is a nice way to set it up. However, there are some bugs in this one. Like for instance, if you mouse over it, eventually it'll show a tooltip. And of course, oh, there it goes, okay. And then in some cases, that tooltip disappears, in some cases it doesn't. So it depends on the circumstances. However, it is a little bit buggy, but hopefully it'll be fixed once the actual release comes out. And the next thing I wanted to show off too is, if you look at the old version of File Explorer, if you were to open another tab and you were to move it around, it essentially does nothing. I mean, you can move the tabs within the File Explorer window, actually. I guess you can, I always thought you could. So apparently you really can't do anything with these tabs. They're just tabs and that's it. However, if you come down here and you look at the new file explorer, now we have the option of not only pulling tabs out so we can create new instances of file explorer, but if you have several instances of File Explorer running, you can grab them, bring them in, and drop them together so you, you can have all of your tabs in one instance. And then finally, so if we were to jump into Documents real quick, and we were to click on a document, we can click on the Details tab right here, which is a lot easier to get to in the new File Explorer than it was in the old one, and it gives you a lot more information. And you know, even if you go and down into Pictures, so if you were to click on the Details and Pictures, it shows you a ton of information about the picture as well as a bigger version of the picture itself. So the details tab is pretty helpful with the new file explorer. And in comparison, if you were to look at the old one, the old detail tab, you have to go up into view, go up into show, and then from show, then you can click on details pane to open it up. And then on top of that, if you were to actually open something, I don't know if I have any actual documents. Here we go doesn't really give you a lot of information on that. It just essentially gives you about the same thing that you can see in the regular File Explorer. So that kind of gives you a look at the new File Explorer, and I think that's a positive update to Windows 11. You know, the File Explorer from Windows 10, and even Windows 7 arguably in some cases, has been going downhill for a while. So it's nice to see File Explorer being improved. And you know, I gotta say, the improvements that I've seen in 23H2, I'm happy with them. In fact, I'm starting to kind of like the Windows 11 File Explorer a lot, but let's move on. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna look at today is something that I think every Windows user has been looking forward to for a really, really, really long time. And that there is RAR and WinZip support natively inside File Explorer. Essentially what this is, is, it, is we've always had the ability to open zip files. So if we open up a zip file, we can open it up and it's no problem at all. However, we've never had the ability to open up 
a RAR file, which has essentially required us to install third-party applications in order to open RAR files. However, there are some downsides to this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna open these up separately right here. I'm gonna open the zip file up in a new tab and I'm gonna open the RAR in this one. So one of the first things that I wanted to point out was while you can still open these files, so here's the zip file here and here's the RAR file, you can't actually open anything from the file. So if I was to double click on this sample image here, as you can see, it does nothing. I'm double clicking right now and it's literally doing nothing at all. But if I click on zip and I was to double click on it, then it opens the image just like you would expect it to. So I don't know if this is just something that hasn't been implemented and it will be when the release actually comes out to the public. But as of right now, essentially all you can do is open the file. However, you can extract it. So if you were to grab the file, drag it out and drop it on say your desktop, and then in that case, then you can open it just fine. For me though, that's kind of an, a nuisance because there's a lot of times that I open up compressed files and open the files directly from them. So that would be something that would be really helpful to implement once it comes out. The other thing is, is that you can't actually create RAR files. You can only extract them. You can't create them like you can zip files, which kind of is a downside. Hopefully that's something that's gonna be implemented soon. This is honestly something that should have happened a long time ago. I don't know why Windows hasn't supported RAR files forever, but for the longest time, what I've had to do is open them on another system and then create a zip file or just transfer the documents over when I needed them because honestly, I don't wanna run WinRAR on all of my systems. It's just a pet peeve, so I don't do it. So typically, I'm always extracting RAR files from a Linux system that comes with it natively built in. And now, it's native in Windows. That's gonna be really positive moving forward. Okay, so moving on, we're gonna go ahead and close our file explorer here. And I wanna concentrate on the desktop because as you can see, I'm not running a stock Windows background. But in reality, I kinda am running a stock Windows background. That's because I'm using Microsoft Spotlight for the background. And this comes turned on by default when you upgrade to 23H2. So if you were to right click on your desktop, go into personalize, you'll see right here when you go into background, background's gonna be set to window spotlight. And of course, this is something you can turn off if you don't want it. However, before you turn it off, I would take a look at some of the features that it comes with. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And as you can see, obviously, it's a pretty nice background that we have right here. However, this background is dynamically changed based on what the Bing background is for that specific day. And you can also come up here, if you look at this little icon right here, if you click on this icon or right click on this icon, it'll tell you exactly what it is that you're looking at. So it's not just a picture that you have no definition for. And it also gives you a choice of different backgrounds that you can use based on the spotlight. So if I was to click on this one, it would change my background to that. And you know, essentially all these different four choices. And then these choices change dynamically as Microsoft releases new pictures. And I don't know exactly what the time frame is. The day I'm filming this video is on a Wednesday and I actually wrote the script and did all the testing and stuff like that on Sunday. So at least it's a few days before the pictures change. I don't know exactly what the time frame is, but this is the same picture that was there during my testing. Now, the one thing that I think would be really nice with this feature is the ability to be able to actually save the background. Like if you can right click and just hit, you know, if you could right click on your background and have somewhere where it says save background image. Unfortunately, it doesn't. And if you click on this picture right here, double click on it, it will open up inside of your default browser, which keep in mind, it actually did honor that my default browser is Chrome and it opens up the Bing homepage that'll show you the spotlight picture. And from there you can re right click and hit save as and save it from that standpoint. However, it saves it as a web page. I don't want the web page. So it would be nice if Microsoft gave us the ability to be able to save these images because there could be a situation where maybe there's a really nice picture that we want to save inside of our pictures folder and we can't because, well, because they don't give us the function to do that. Now, like I said before, this is turned on by default, but if you decide you don't wanna use it, to turn it off, all you do is right click, go into personalize, come over to your backgrounds section, and then just stick on picture, and it'll go to a regular photograph instead. This is the default background that I had prior to Windows Spotlight being turned on, so it changed it back to that. And from what I understand, 
Microsoft claims that if you do turn off Windows Spotlight, they will honor that the next time there's an update. So it's not going to be one of those things where you're going to have to turn it off all the time. Once you turn it off, it's off forever. The other positive about the new changes to the Windows 11 background is HDR support. Now, if you have one monitor that's HDR and another monitor that's not, it will actually show the background image in HDR on the HDR monitor, but just regular SDR on the regular monitor. So that's definitely a plus. I like some of the tweaks that they did, and I actually kind of like Windows Spotlight because I like to see random pictures, you know? Sue me. <laughs> it's what I like. Okay, so now the next feature that I'm going to show you is one that people have been complaining about since the release of Windows 11. And that right there is, we're going to go into our taskbar settings, and I'm going to show you here, is if we go into taskbar behaviors, we have combined taskbar buttons and hide labels. Now, right now it's set to always. So essentially what's going to happen is if you open multiple things of different programs, like right here, I've got File Explorer opened three times right here, you can see that essentially all the labels are hidden and the icons themselves are combined. However, if you come into your taskbar settings, come down to the bottom right here where it says combine taskbar buttons and you change this to never, then as you can see, it doesn't combine for the programs that are currently running. So like you can see, there's obviously no label for Chrome because it's not currently running. But if I was to open it, you'll see that it'll now give me the label and it won't combine the icon. So if I open multiple different Chrome windows, it'll give me multiple different instances of Chrome on the desktop itself. However, when you do highlight over it, it will, regardless of which one you're doing, you can see that it will show all three available as you mouse over them. So I think that's a really cool feature and I think it's a really kind of a good compromise for what Microsoft's had in the past of just always having everything combined. From what I understand, Microsoft's going out of their way to try to implement features of the taskbar that were removed when the Windows 11 taskbar came out. Because as everyone has said in the past, the Windows 11 taskbar has way fewer features than the Windows 10 one did. And luckily Microsoft is listening and they're bringing a lot of these features back to the Windows 11 taskbar. You know, it's taking a while for them to do it though, but at least we're getting something. And that's a positive. Another really neat feature that's in the Windows 11 taskbar, you have to actually turn on. It doesn't come turned on by default, but let me show you. If you go into your system section in settings right here, go down to for developers. So right down here, for developers, and then you want to go to right here, end task. And if you turn that on, it gives you a really cool feature. So right now I've got all of these different versions of of Explorer or File Explorer running. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this so we can see all of our file explorers. Well, now if I right click on this now, you can see end all tasks. If I click that, they all go away. And I think that's a really cool feature. I don't know why Microsoft doesn't just turn it on by default, but if you want it turned on, then it's going to be right here in the developer section in Windows 11 23H2. And then the next taskbar feature that I want to show you guys, and this one here I think is kind of worthless, but some people might like it. But if you go into settings, you go into time and language, and you go into date and time, you see that you have a new setting right here that says show time and date in the system tray. So your clock right here, if you were to switch this off, it essentially just turns off your clock. And you know me, I take advantage of that clock a lot. So that's not a feature that I'm personally going to be using, but I was talking about the taskbar, so I thought I'd throw it in here. Now the next feature, I'm only showing this one because it's extremely bad and it's one of the criticisms that I'm going to make in this new version of Windows 11. But that's the new Windows Backup app. So if we click on Start, we type Backup, we open up Windows Backup. Essentially they have a simple little backup program for you here. However, it is absolutely worthless if you don't have a Microsoft account. Because what this does is it essentially backs up your data to OneDrive. It doesn't back it up to the system. It just backs it up to OneDrive. And then let's open it again real here. There's absolutely no advanced settings. I mean, you can't do anything at all in here. Essentially, all you can do is back up your settings. You can't add files and folders to the backup set. You can't do anything at all other than just back up the predetermined things that Microsoft thinks that you should need to back up inside of a Windows PC, which honestly, I don't think is very helpful. Also, when it comes to apps, this will only back up the apps for 
apps that you purchase from the Windows Store. Anything that's a regular x86 app that you install separately, it will back up the data for those apps, but it won't back up the app itself. However, since I'm right here, I'm gonna show you guys a backup function from within Windows that's actually useful. So if we go ahead and close this, I'm gonna go ahead and go to Control Panel. And you have to do this from Control Panel now in Windows 11. This is something that Microsoft recently changed. But if you go into Control Panel and you search for File History and open that up, you can enable File History. And this one is a lot more customizable. So if you go into Advanced Settings, you can tell it how often you want it to back up. You can even exclude or change what folders are actually getting backed up. So if we click under exclude folders right here, you can exclude folders from the backup and you can also add folders to your backup set if you wanna do that as well. I think this is a much more useful backup tool. Unfortunately, it's kind of hidden in Windows 11 now. You used to be able to go ahead and open up the settings and then just search for backup in order to get to the file history settings, but not anymore apparently. So I find this kind of amusing. Microsoft is going out of their way to move control panel applets to settings, which is something I've complained about in the past that's a major annoyance to me with Microsoft. However, with the Windows file history, apparently they removed it from settings completely and it's only in control panel now. It's kind of a hint that they might be trying to get rid of it. So hopefully they don't because I use file history all the time and that's typically what I use on my customer systems to set backups up for them. But it looks like Microsoft might be trying to depreciate file history in order to move to their own cloud version in order to push OneDrive, which is a little disappointing, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so the next one that I'm gonna show you, we're gonna need the settings app for this one right here. So the next one, and I think this is gonna be a really cool feature if it actually turns out being a good feature, which is kind of hard to explain, so let me show you. So from within settings, if you go into personalization, from personalization you have dynamic lighting. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you how this works, and the reason why is because all the RGB on my system isn't supported, so it doesn't actually do anything on my specific system at this time. But the purpose of this is to cut down on third-party apps, so you don't have to have custom apps from different manufacturers in order to control your RGB lighting. Instead, you can put it all into one spot and control all your RGB right here from within Windows settings. However, unfortunately, it requires support from the manufacturer in order to get the RGB to actually function from within the dynamic lighting settings. And I'm kind of questioning whether or not it's gonna actually get this support because, you know, third-party manufacturers kind of like their bloatware on people's systems for some reason. However, if this does work out, it's a great alternative, I think. So right here, essentially, all you do is you go down to effects, you can change the color of your RGB, you can change the kind of effects your RGB is doing, so if you wanna to go to breathing, rainbow, and things of that nature, it's really, really crude and doesn't have a lot of features, but I can see this growing into something that is very useful if it gets support. And that right there is the whole problem, is it has to have manufacturer support to work. You know, if Corsair or Asus or all these other companies don't actually support it with, from within Windows, then it won't change the RGB. And as you can see, my RGB is all still blue, regardless of what the application says it is. So hopefully this is gonna be an app that will help in the future, at least as feature that will help to cut down on having to have third-party applications because personally, I hate having the custom RGB apps on my system from different manufacturers, but it's maybe pressures some of these manufacturers to support Windows 11 dynamic lighting, you know? Wouldn't hurt trying, so send your emails if you want that support. Just for the record, not to me, but to the manufacturers, all right? <laughs> Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna look at, and this one, I've gotta give praise to Microsoft because this is something that I didn't even notice. And maybe you guys have, but I typically don't use dark mode. So typically what I do is if we go into colors, the way my system is normally set up is to custom, and my app mode itself is set to light while the Windows mode is set to dark. This is how I typically use my computer. So I didn't notice this change. But if you come here and you look at dark, you'll notice that no matter what application you run, whether it be File Explorer, whether it be even Notepad, you'll notice that 
it has consistency across the operating system now with its themes. You don't have like the file explorer before didn't support black mode and neither did notepad. Even the, if you had dark mode turned on, they would still come up as light. However, there is one application that that doesn't happen in. So if we were to open up our virtual machine here, and like I said, this is 22H2 that I have running in a virtual machine. But if we were to run paint, as you'll see, paint is light, regardless of what you're doing. However, if you open File Explorer, it's dark. And if you open Notepad, Notepad also is dark in 22H2. And this is what I didn't notice, is I didn't notice Microsoft has been working to make their theme consistent across the different applications. So now if we go into 23H2 and we were to open Paint, you'll notice that Paint now has a dark theme, which I don't know, I just have to say, I don't ever use Paint, literally never, for almost nothing. It's essentially worthless to me other than just being able to paste screenshots. However, it is nice to know that Microsoft is really is dedicated to making all the different applications from within Windows show some consistency. So yeah, Paint has a dark mode theme now. Cool. So I just have to reiterate, I have to praise Microsoft when praise is due. And Windows 11 really is starting to look more consistent across its different applications. When it was first released, it was kind of a hodgepodge of some applications still kind of looked like Windows 10, some looked like Windows 11, some supported dark mode, some didn't. And now it looks like Microsoft is making a genuine effort to make the UI look consistent across the entire operating system, which, you know, this is positive right here. So we have to give Microsoft credit where credit is due, and they really are doing a great job of making Windows 11 look really good. So now we're moving on to probably one of my favorite new features in Windows 11. And this one's going to be cool. Let's check it out. Okay, so let's get some of this stuff out of our way right here. We're going to go ahead and close some of these programs right here. And now the next thing that we're going to look at is virtual drives. And this has never been a thing in Windows before. This is something brand new coming to Windows 11. Let me show you how it works. So if you click on your start button, go into settings, now to get here, we want to go into system, then we want to go into storage, and then from storage, we want to go into advanced settings right down here at the bottom. And then from advanced settings, we want to select disks and volumes right here. So here's all your different disks and volumes. Obviously right now, I've only got one because this is my regular hard drive. However, right here, you'll see that you have the ability to create a virtual hard drive. And if you click create VHD, It'll give all of these different options right here. So let's go ahead and create one. I'm going to create a, we'll just call it data drive. And then location of this, and this location is going to be the physical location of the virtual drive as it's stored on the computer. So I'm going to go ahead and hit browse. I'm going to click on documents. We're just going to go ahead and throw it in our documents folder. And then the virtual disk size, let's just say we want to make it one gigabyte just like that. And then from here, what we can do is have a couple of different choices right here of different kinds of virtual drives that we can create. We can create a VHD or a VHDX, and it'll give you the description right here what the difference between the two is. And then you can either make it a fixed size or dynamically expanding. If you make it one gigabyte and you made it fixed, it's going to be a one gigabyte file regardless of how many files that you have on the virtual drive. And we're going to get to what that means in a little bit. So stay tuned. It's really cool. So if you go to dyna dynamically expanding, what this means is that the virtual hard drive is only ever going to be as big as the files that are contained within it. So if you select dynamically expanding, this is the one that I highly recommend using. This is the one that you're probably going to want to go with. So we go ahead and hit create. And it's going to create the virtual drive. And then it gives you the option of what kind of file format you want. Do you want it GPT or MBR? We're just going to leave it GPT and hit initialize. And then from this point, we can make our label. So I'm going to put just data as the label for the drive letters. D is just fine. File system. And at this point, it's going to be just like formatting a regular hard drive. So we're going to go ahead and hit format. And I'm not sure why it gave us that error because then it immediately opened it right here. But that's okay. We'll go ahead and hit okay. All right. So like I said, beta copies of Windows have bugs. And that there I think was one of them. But let's move on. Okay. So if we open File Explorer here and we go to this PC, as you'll see, we have a regular hard drive here. And to the operating system, it just 
looks like a hard drive. If we open it up, we can open it up and we can throw stuff into it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna open another copy of File Explorer here. We're gonna open up our documents. And let's just go ahead and take our video temp folder and we're gonna take that and drag it in and drop it into our data drive here. So as you can see here, we now have this folder with these different files inside of it. So, so there's a couple things we can do with this. We can just essentially use it like a regular hard drive, like we had a second drive in our computer. Now it's going to be taking up space on your primary drive, so it doesn't give you any more space. However, it does give you a really secure way to store data, because as you can see, we have data in here right now, and if we want, we can always go back, we can right click on it, and we can hit eject. And what eject does is it just does exactly what it sounds like. It's like pulling a thumb drive out of your computer. However, if you go down into your file explorer here and you go into the documents where we stored it, as you can see right here, we have this data drive. And this is the virtual drive right here. If we double click on it, it will automatically remount it right here in this PC and we can use it as a drive again. So this is a really good way to be able to secure data. So, you know, if you have something that you don't want prying eyes to see, you can throw it in a virtual drive and then just right click and hit eject when you don't want that virtual drive to be around. So I'm gonna show you another thing that you can do with this to make it even more secure. So if we go back into documents, we open up our virtual drive right here, and then we go back to this PC. If you right click on this, you still have full BitLocker support. So if we turn on BitLocker, we can go ahead and use a password to unlock the drive. So for my password, I'm just gonna write password. Do it twice right here and then go ahead and hit next. It's going to want you to save your recovery key somewhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save as file. We'll just throw it in our documents right here and then hit next. And then we can encrypt only use disk space or encrypt the entire drive. I'm gonna do the entire drive and then hit next. And then new encryption mode, yes. We're gonna hit next and then start encrypting. And then what this has done now is this has now encrypted this hard drive. So if we refresh here, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this, go back to this PC. And as you can see now, it's currently unlocked. So you can open it up just like you're using any drive. And this works exactly the same on any BitLocker drive. But now what you can do is if you eject it and you were to go back into your documents folder where it's stored, as you can see, here's the data drive. Now this time, if you double click on it, it's inaccessible. And the reason it's inaccessible is because it's locked. As you can see right there, it's locked. So if we double click on it now, it's gonna ask you for your BitLocker password. So in this case, it's password, and it'll go ahead and unlock the drive and you can get the data out of it. Now, personally, I think this is a really, really cool feature and I can see tons of different ways that this could be helpful. You could take a large amount of data that you wanna store for whatever reason you want, whether you want it to be secure, whether you want it to be hidden, whether you want it to be password protected, doesn't matter, you can store it all into a virtual drive and then you can take that virtual drive and move it between computers by simply copying the actual virtual drive file that you stored wherever it is you stored it onto a thumb drive and moving it somewhere else. I think this comes in really handy and I think this is gonna be a really cool feature in Windows 11. But as you can see, there's lots of really cool features coming to Windows 11. Also, I only covered the ones that I kind of found interesting in one way or another. There's a lot more and I urge you to check out what other people are saying about 23H2. This really is going to be a pretty big update for Windows 11. A few of my favorite features are the native support for RAR and WinZip files, of course, as well as support for virtual hard drives, like I stated before. I think these two features alone may convince me to upgrade to Windows 11. However, I also have to say that I really like the new File Explorer interface, and if Microsoft can get manufacturers behind the new RGB lighting controls, that should seriously change the game when it comes to third-party software, especially third-party RGB programs, which essentially are useless other than changing the color of your computer case. I'm a big advocate of cutting down on the amount of third-party programs that we need on our systems. So features that help us install less bloatware are always a positive in my book. But let me know in the comments below what features you're most looking forward to in the new version of Windows 11.
From what I understand, there are not going to be any more feature updates for Windows 10. So these new features are coming to Windows 11 are going to be exclusively on Windows 11. If you'd like to install the new beta of 23H2 yourself before it's released, then you can always pick up an ISO from UUP Dump if you want to install it without a Microsoft account. Unfortunately though, the UUP Dump website was down when I was doing the research for this video. So alternatively, you can use a cool script that I found on GitHub called Offline Insider Enroll that will enable the Insider program from within Windows without a Microsoft account. Then you can just download it in Windows Update. However, I highly recommend against running beta copies of Windows on a machine that you rely on every day. Because trust me when I say, they really are buggy. But if you'd like to know how to use UUP Dump in order to get the new version of Windows 11, then I did a video on that a while back that you can check out here. I'm currently running build 22.631.2262, but the latest build from the beta channel should be 23H2. As always, you guys have a great day.